else had their microphone on that got messed up. So, but now I was able to select your name uh, for the stream of it. So, so that's going to be good. So I'll start so few uh, streaming to YouTube. And I'm just waiting for it to actually show up there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we are live on YouTube, so welcome everyone to SQL Friday number 131, uh, which is with Wright Saskens, who is going to present code, deploy, and maintain your Azure data infrastructure with confidence. So it's going to be a lot of automation, I assume, infrastructure oh, good question. and stuff like that. Uh, right, so it's a returning speaker. Oh, I think yeah. last time you were here, we you want, presented yeah. about... Uh, it, it was about using Sabix, I think, on, uh, well, yeah, so. Uh, welcome everyone on the YouTube live stream and welcome everyone on the Teams call. So we're doing a bit of both and we will see if everything works fine with the YouTube stream, we're gonna skip or I'm gonna skip sending out the Teams link to attendees. But we're we're doing a bit of both. To, thank to you so much, Magnus. Uh, thank you for having me again. It's um, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, last time was a lot of fun. I'm going to so, um, yeah, let's see what happens right, this time. So stop talking is that then? Uh, I put the ad flash on uh, on the screen Friday, right now right. for those of you who are tuning in and weren't really sure what was going to happen today. So um, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, let's start my timer, and then this should work as well because we've got the title slide. Um, let's start with a few things in advance. One of the things that mostly bothers me is when I'm attending a session and I'm not sure if the slides will be shared, if the code is shared, so I'm taking pictures or making notes or whatever. For those of you who wonder about that, all my code, all my slides will be available through GitHub. Uh, there will be a QR code at the end if I didn't mess up my slides, um, and you can get all the stuff there. So just um, Enjoy the session, I hope. And um, if you have questions during the session, uh, please ask them in the chat. Um, I'm hoping Magnus will ask them when they pop up because um, I like interaction in the session. So if you have a question, just uh, put it in the chat. I'll uh, make sure the question gets asked and I'll uh, try and answer it. About the code, um, it's provided as is. There's no warranty that it will function flawlessly because sometimes as it changes, uh, things change. Uh, sometimes you need extra elements in your code, whatever. The basics have worked. I'll show you in screenshots uh, later. Whenever you get code from somebody else, always think about it, read the code, evaluate it for your own purposes, and only then run it. When you've deployed my code, please review it before you add any data to it. Even if it's just the AdventureWorks database, just review it and check out all the security settings, everything that's there, and maybe things that are not there that you want there. Um, and it's not production grade, of course. Again, before we start, when you start deploying resources to Azure, you need to think about security and privacy. This is one, um, quote I found uh, uh, on the English IT governance blog, where it said there are a lot of security incidents in 2022. I didn't find the reasons for 2023 yet, but over a thousand security incidents with 480,000 breached records. That's a lot. But they're not on there. When I'm looking in my own country, and they're even further behind on the, on the data, 21,000 data leaks and 1,826 cyber attacks in 2022. Again, that's a lot. So when you're working in Azure, when, you're, when you put data there, make sure it's safe. And I think that you don't want to be in these st statistics. Stay out of them. Make sure your deployment is safe. 
Now, this is some uh, a little information about me. Um, my name is Reitz Eskens. I'm working for a consultancy company in the Netherlands, uh, which has um, uh, offices all around the world, but I'm focused in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff uh, also uh, uh, outside of work, if you will. Um, I was uh, nominated for the MVP award last year, and it was granted uh, uh, early this year in January. So I can call myself an MVP now, even though it feels quite unreal. Uh, I'm an MCT as well, so I can uh, provide training on uh, the stuff I'm certified in. And well, the rest you can read for yourself because you're not here for me, you're here for this. Let's start a journey. Let's start with a brilliant idea. Let's say your company, your management, whoever said, you know what, we're going to move all our stuff to the cloud. We've had it with all our on-premises hardware, we're going to move to the cloud. And Tag, you're it. You're the one who can uh, design the solution, uh, make sure it's safe, and build it. So the four steps. The first one is just the idea. Management has the idea. Cool. Let's start working with it. So first of all, we need to architect for the security. And to architect for the security, there are a few things we need to think about. Let's dig into these because it's always a story. It's always things that are happening. So let's <coughs> sorry. Let's uh, think about the resource security. The first thing you want to do. I'm sorry. The first thing you want. First thing you want to do is to create a number of policies because you don't want unwanted changes, unwanted deployments. One of the things Microsoft was warning us about, if, uh, I think it was early last year, is that the moment an account leaked for an Azure environment, hackers would, would try to get into your environment, not to get your data, but to deploy huge machines. They found out that these hackers were deploying M-sized machines with the most cores, most memory, whatever, not to play around with, but to uh, start mining Bitcoin. And mining Bitcoin is nowadays not really, not really efficient because it costs a lot of money to get a little bit of Bitcoin. But when you don't have to pay for the compute, you've got a win-win situation. You don't pay and you get some, uh, some Bitcoin. There were companies who were faced with um, quite large bills at the end of the month, and they were asking Microsoft, well, uh, it wasn't us, uh, we were hacked. Can you uh, reimburse us or uh, skip this part of the bill? And Mark said, no, we're not going to do that. You're going to pay for this. It was your fault. But they were really active in teaching us MFA all your stuff and make sure people can't deploy machines you don't want to. So one of the first policies I'm always deploying is one that really restricts the deployment of VMs. My basic policy says you get a B or a D uh, tier machine. That's it. The rest will be disallowed by the policy, making sure you don't get these unwanted costs. Something else is about your data security. How many times has it happened that somebody dropped a database, changed something? Oops, I should not have done that. I should not have deleted this. And we had to restore all the stuff to get our data back. That's not fun. So let's prevent accidental deletions by just putting a delete lock on, on the resources. Whenever anybody presses the delete button on the resource, a message will pop up. There's lock in place. You can't delete it unless you remove the delete lock. And to be able to remove the delete lock, you need elevated permissions to do that. So as long as nobody has the permissions to remove the delete lock, Nobody can delete the resources, and your data is more safe. It's also more than general res uh, user security. I hope this one is just kicking in an open door. MFA, 2FA, whatever you want to call it, it should be the default. But you can also think about just-in-time access. For a virtual machine, if you open up port 3389 for remote desktop, if it's always open, 
it is potential to injection for people to get in uh, and do nasty stuff to your machine. But if you're using just-in-time access, the port is always closed until you, as a user who has the permission to log on to that machine, opens up this port. Then you can log in, the port closes after you, but your connection will stay alive. It's a really nice feature to add some extra security to your uh, environment and to your machine. You can also enable privileged identity management, where every user is just a general user until you request your permissions to be elevated. And when uh, and the request for elevation needs to be approved by somebody else. So when I'm working uh, late, late at night after a few beers, thinking, hmm, maybe I should change this setting to something else and I need uh, elevated permissions for that, I need to request those permissions. And as long as long, nobody responds telling me, go ahead, I won't be able to do that. Again, an extra security to prevent unwanted changes and to make sure your users are acting in a secure way. Also, this helps in your governance because every time you need to, uh, or you request the elevations of your elevation of your permissions, there's a registration within Azure when the elevation was requested, who approved the elevation, and why. So you can always go back in time and see why things happened. You also need to educate your key users. Key users usually have extra permissions. Educate them. Here are the keys to a special resource. Handle with care. With great power comes great responsibility. Educate them so they know what's happening. And finally, try and enforce security tools like Key Vault for a secure storage of your secure, uh, access keys, uh, your connection strings, all those resources. Make sure they're safe. Again, on Key Vault, you've got your role based access control. Who can access it? If you're not eligible to access it, you can't see it, can't connect. One other thing, when you're architecting, assume breach. Assume that you're already that you've already been hacked. So what can you do against it? How can you prevent the impact of the hack? How can you prevent hackers getting to your data? Think about this one. What can you do to prevent it? What was the possible way that they got they got in? Can you close that that route? Hackers are constantly scanning for open ports. They're always trying to find out, ooh, who's on 3389? Who's on 1433? Hmm, nice, there's a port there, can I get in? Using a different port will slow a hacker down usually a few seconds because they're scanning all the ports. Just trying to see what protocol is running behind a port number. Make sure that everything is as secure as you can. With a zero trust, you're always denying traffic unless somebody is allowed to uh, to have access to a resource or to have access to data. Minimize access. If you are taking all these guidelines literally, the fun thing that will happen is that nobody will have access to anything anymore, which is really safe for your data, but maybe not the outcome you were looking for. So you need to use them a bit, a bit like guidelines. We're saying, all right, this is what we are almost going to do, but we're going to fi find a way to make sure it all keeps working. Because in the end, especially for us working in data, we need to make sure the people using the reports see some data. So there's always a balance. Okay. No, uh, please interrupt. I forgot to ask you, right? So, do you want to be interrupted with questions, or do you want yeah. to leave them to to the end? So, there is one now from uh, Buke. Uh, <laughs> what is your experience um, with security incident response process? Meaning, let me when think about this one for a few customer. seconds because it's uh, 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 it was about a customer. This was, uh, I think, three years ago. The customer had a website running. Uh, it's all been taken down uh, since then, so it's. Uh, uh, and not able, you're not able to do it anymore. But they had a website running uh, for something about uh, with their employees, 
and that one got hacked uh, through SQL injection. So when you uh, uh, when you logged in, you could just enter uh, SQL commands in in all the form fields, and they went to the database. The customer found out very quickly that something was wrong because they had some kind of monitoring running on it. And then we were asked to find out what actually happened. And what we did on the database, on the yeah, on the database, uh, we had a log analytics uh, running that registered every query that was running on the database, which is maybe a bit of an expensive one. On the other hand, we could see exactly what the queries were that uh, the hacker tried to execute. The queries were executed successfully. The result was that the, the hacker found uh, the yeah. database uh, schema, so all the uh, schema names, table names, column names, data types, uh, stuff like that. But they didn't did manage to get into the data because they used the wrong schema to uh, select data from the database. That was our luck, because if they had found out that everything was in the DBO schema, mm -hmm. they would have gotten all the data, including um, uh, uh, personal uh, PII information. That would have been bad. But I think uh, uh, we. Uh, close the investigation within 48 hours. Yeah. Does that answer the question? <clears throat> I think so. Let's see okay. if Buke agrees. Yeah, of course. Nothing more just, in the uh, chat. Just so I think no we can continue. Then, uh, Buki, you follow up if you have follow up questions. So, how are we going to de deploy all this stuff? When we've architected for security, we know what we want to achieve, what we're going to do. How are we going to deploy this? This is where my personal favorite infrastructure as a code comes in. So, let's see what, uh, what it's all about. First of all, what are we talking about? What is infrastructure as code? As I said, it's my favorite way. It's the easiest way to deploy resources in Azure. All you have to do is create code once, and you can run it time after time after time after time, and you get the same result, which is what you want. Unless you're using variables to change certain things, like uh, I want a specific setting for a test environment, I want different settings for development, I want completely different ones for production. You can use variables for that. But whatever you put in, the results will be the same. Instead of logging onto Azure portal, searching for, I need a virtual network, click. I'm going to configure my virtual network. So I need to type in the name. I need to type in the CIDR range. I need to type in all the other stuff. And when I hit uh, accept and create, I find out I made a typo, need to delete it and try again. Click ops are really time consuming. Code it once and you're done. As I said, repeatable without differences, parameters. But you need to know, understand one thing. There are two kinds of um, infrastructure as code. There's the imperative way, that's this one. It's like you define everything it, I want a virtual machine, and it has to have this tier. It has to have this, uh, this SKU. Every little thing needs to be configured within the code. PowerShell is one example of this one. You're slowly working towards your goal, step by step by step. It's like playing chess. You're moving your pawn, you're moving your queen, you're moving your king, and finally, checkmate. In a, or in my case, I lose the game. PowerShell, as I said, is one. The other one is declarative. Like Jean-Luc Picard, all he says is, I want a virtual machine, make it so. So I'm going to define the outcome. What do you want to have? I want a VM that has this configuration. I don't want to be bothered with all the small details. I just want to make sure I get what I desire. And all the different, all the different difficult stuff, all the different steps, I don't care. Bicep Terraform are more declarative tools. We can just define the outcome and say, do your thing, let me know when you're done. 
These are two important differences to keep in the back of your mind when you're writing your infrastructure as code. And when you think, all right, what, what, uh, what will be my favorite approach? There are a few flavors. I've already touched on a few ones. The first one are the ARM templates, which is, which is the kind of the core of Azure. Whatever tool you're using, in the end, an ARM template will be created for you and used to deploy the resource. Thing is, I've tried to create my own ARM te templates. I deeply, deeply hate them because it's it's hard to code them. It, it just doesn't fit in my mind. Maybe I'm not smart enough. I don't know, but I don't like them. So when you're moving up one step, you can uh, use the uh, AC PowerShell commandlets, which are much easier, but again, these are the declarative ones. You need to define every step. Or you start using Bicep or Terraform, Terragrunt, or uh, Pulumi, what, whichever one you prefer, or maybe your own hybrid of code if you if you like, it's okay. There is a discussion between people using Bicep and people using Terraform, and some people are really ready to die on a hill. Or, this is the best one. That's not me. Personally, I don't mind which one you choose. I, I like Terraform. If you like Bicep, be my guest. Um, it's in my opinion, it's not better or worse. It's just different. They have different, uh, different things that run really well, and they've got different challenges where things don't run as, as well. That's okay. And one of the good things when you're using infrastructure as code is you can store your code in a Git solution. Whether you're using uh, DevOps or GitHub, again. Whatever fits your need. Um, my personal favorite is GitHub, but that's more because I kind of grew up in them with it. And they're code repository, so you can do your code versioning and everything in it as you like. If you're using DevOps, there's always uh, you can also use the Kanban boards for uh, 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 to work as a team to collaborate, um, work together, all, all that kind of stuff. And there are pipelines to do the heavy lifting or actions if you're in GitHub. So you don't have to do everything yourself. You can just create a pipeline and in the end, just tell the pipeline, do your stuff and tell me when you're done. And everything will happen automatically. Or in my case, usually fill. One of the best things is you can do a pull request. So you can um, create your code, test it for yourself, and then have a be a review by one of your coworkers or somebody else before it gets promoted to production and people start using it. So when I think I've created the best code ever, which will never fail, and somebody else will look at it and maybe or surely find something that can be improved. So your quality goes up. Time for some demos. I've created my, uh, my demos in Terraform with PowerShell as a kind of supporting act. I'll show you in a minute. As I said, uh, uh, Terraform, not better or worse than Bicep, just different. And I did not include uh, DevOps to prevent some overload. But before I'm going to show you the demos, this was a little teaser, we need to build our solution. We need to think about what we're going to do. So you need to build from the ground up. From the ground up, in my case, means top down. I need a number of management groups for my administration to split workloads, to split policies, to split security. This is the highest level you can find within Azure to split uh, all the permissions, all the, uh, uh, all the other stuff. You can also do it on your subscription level. But in my personal view, the best way to enforce a policy is from the management group because it trickles down to everything when that's in this uh, management group. And not everybody gets uh, even reader rights on the management group, whereas sometimes people get a little too many, uh, yeah, too many permissions on the subscription. So the higher I'm locking them in, 
the harder it will be to change my policies. These are some policies I'm usually uh, applying. I'm restricting the VM size, as I talked about earlier. And I'm, um, I'm searching for the right sentence. <laughs> um, I'm only allowing West Europe, which means my data will not leave the country. Some, uh, some customers really, really want me to enforce that because their data, uh, they're enforced to keep the data only in the Netherlands. To get a feel on the hierarchy, when I've got a, a, a management group, a management group can have one or more subscriptions, and a subscription can have one or more resource groups, and a resource group can have one or more resources. That's the way it trickles down. You can't have one resource group in multiple subscriptions. It's always bound to one. The same for the subscriptions. So this is the hierarchy we're working with. If you want a policy applied to a specific resource, the policy needs to exist in the level above it, whether it's a subscription or management group, preferably the management group. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. Then, when we've created the schema of all uh, of the hierarchy, then we're going to the lowest level, which is networking. In my opinion, every resource should be connected to a virtual network. Hello function apps, hello logic apps, who don't have Vnet integration. And secretly, hello Microsoft Fabric that doesn't have Vnet integration as well. Most of the resources do have the ability to have a, a, a private link connection into a virtual network, which means I can control all the traffic. When you're deploying a local virtual network, you need to think about your side range, because most of the time, I hope there will be some kind of VPN connection to your on-premises environment. And when cider ranges start to overlap, funny things happen. Or not so funny things, depending on your um, network admin. Your yeah, subnets matter as well, because a number of subnets have fixed names, for instance, for Bastion, for instance, for uh, the virtual network gateway. They have fixed names that need to be in place to make that resource work. Always secure your subnets with a network security group. Even if you're running with uh, an Azure firewall or a firewall solution uh, that's not from Azure, but from uh, uh, something you're using on-premises, always secure your network with a network security group. Add layers to your network. Make sure everything is as secure as possible. Also make sure you secure each network interface card with its own network security group. This creates a layered, a layered network where the network within of the, I'm sorry, where the traffic on the subnet will be able to travel somewhat freely. But as soon as it's uh, directed towards the network interface card, it hits the second network security group making sure that your traffic will only be allowed to your network interface card if it is allowed there. It's the right port number, it's the right source IP, it's the right source within Azure, whatever, whatever your configuration. But add layers. One thing I found uh, within customers is that I've, uh, I found a network security group with about 50 rules with all kinds of IP numbers and port numbers without any description what they were for. And then they were wondering, why isn't it working? Uh, it's hit by this rule, but I'm not sure what this one is doing. Who made this rule? I don't know. I can't see. What is this for? I don't know. There's no documentation. All right, let's delete rule and see what happens. Somebody will start screaming, my solution doesn't work anymore. Cool. You know what this one was for. If you add a description to your network security group rule, other people who might need to take over management of the network security group will find out, ah, this is what it's for. Nice. And now we've changed our way of working, so we don't need this one anymore, so we can delete it. Or we need to change it or whatever. It makes life easier, especially if you have to fix a bug at night. When you deploy Azure resources, there was a time where 
public access was always enabled. I think it's gone nowadays. The default is that public access is denied. But always check. Please make sure you're using private endpoints only. Don't allow unfiltered traffic from the internet. It can only lead to bad things. If you're using private endpoints, you get the Azure DNS entries. They will be created automatically. Again, secure every endpoint with, with its own network security group and add a useful description. Check on your public access. Check it from your own machine. Create a policy if you can uh, uh, to make sure this uh, uh, the access, the public access denial is enforced. And check it from your own machine. Pick up the uh, uh, URL, for instance, from a storage account, put it in your browser and see what happens. Use Azure Storage Explorer to find out if you can connect to a storage and how far you can get. Can you only see the container names or can you even get into the folders? Check for yourself that the security is working the way you expect. If you want to make sure you can connect in a secure way, it's either VPN or Bastion right now. So VPN is for all the traffic from your on-premises environment to the Azure environment. If you're using a side-to-side -side VPN, if you're using a point-to-side VPN, you can make sure your laptop, your computer, whatever, gets an IP within the virtual network and you can connect to all the resources. So you have a VPN connection, a secure connection, you're part of that network, you're allowed in. I'm not going to say it's easy to configure. There are a lot of things to think about, a lot of keys and, and, and uh, uh, passphrases and stuff that comes with the VPN. It takes some time to configure, but it's worth it. Again, make sure you allow the correct side ranges from your on-premises environment to prevent uh, nasty mishaps. Um, you can lose the Azure firewall and can is uh, in capitals on purpose. You can lose it if you, you've shut everything down. Nothing can come into your Azure environment from the internet. In that case, you can lose the Azure firewall and make sure your on-premises firewall handles everything. It'll save you about a thousand euros every month. On the other hand, if something still open to the internet for whatever reason, you might want to rethink the decision. If you want access to your virtual machine and you don't have the VPN or a VPN is secured as well and as a consultant you can't easily, easily use it, that's the Bastion option. Bastion is a service deployed by Microsoft where you can uh, use remote desktop from your browser. It works quite quite good. Uh, if you're using the basic one, it's just you're in your browser, you can copy text and that's it. But you can do everything on the VM that you're permitted to do. If you're using the standard one, you can download the RDP file, create a secure connection to the uh, virtual machine and even copy files. And when you can copy files, you can always introduce something that might not be wanted on that machine. So again, think about if you want to offer that option to consultants, to coworkers, whatever. Again, always secure all these resources with the network security group. Make sure you encrypt everything you can. The default, are uh, the Microsoft, uh, what is it, Microsoft standard uh, encryption keys, Microsoft handled encryption keys, I don't know what the exact term is. You can bring your own custom, uh, custom key as well. If you use your own key, Microsoft has to do more work if they even want to get to your data. Databases have a, um, uh, by default transparent database encryption. Uh, the funny thing is, uh, VMs have uh, the data, the disk encryption enabled as well, but it never shows up in the uh, Microsoft Defender for Cloud advisors. It always tells me, you need to encrypt your disks, but they are encrypted. But you need to encrypt your disks, but no. well, I've given up on that one. I'm 
I know the disks are encrypted. I know the data is safe. Thing is, it just doesn't doesn't show up in the uh, Microsoft Defender. You can add your own certificate to uh, uh, enhance even um, the connection security. Uh, ah, this was the other one I was talking about, about the disk encryption. So let's see some code, because I've been talking for quite some time. Um, but before I dig into that, are there any questions in the chat, Magnus? Uh, no questions in this chat and no questions on the YouTube, so no. OK. Then let's go to the code. I am using Visual Studio Code. And what I'm always starting out with is a main file. And this main file um, contains a lot of uh, a lot of um, basic terms that I'm using all over. So this one tells me um, the SRM, where, where it's from, and what's the minimal version. So I'm using 3.21.1 as a minimum, but I can go over. The Azure ID, I'm using uh, version 2.15. Required version of Terraform is 1.5 or higher. I've got some features, and I've got the first thing you see here is my tenant ID. And this isn't hard coded, but it's a variable var tenant ID. All right, so what does this one do? Well, I've got a variables file. There's this one, variables.tf. In this file, there are a lot of, uh, I can declare all my variables. So I can either create this uh, once, or I can even create this on runtime. I can have uh, PowerShell generate this file for me with uh, everything in it that I need. In this case, I've got my tags. It's a map because it's an array of uh, stuff. So I've got a few tags in here. But what I was looking for is the tenant ID. That's this one. I've got my tenant ID. It's a string type. It's got a default value. And I've got a description. So whenever I'm scrolling through my variables file, I know what this one is about. I've got an ID of my management group, subscription, etc. I've got my resource group naming here. So every time I'm running this code, it's always using the same names. I don't have, if I'm making a typo, there's only one place I need to fix it because these variables are being reused through all my other files. So let's get back to the main one because there's more. This little thing will return my local IP address. Why do I need my local IP address? Because I want access, for instance, to my key vault. The only way I can get access to my key vault is when my public IP address is added to that firewall, because I won't be able to deploy my VPN connection from code, including all the other stuff that's needed uh, with it. But I want to access my, uh, uh, my key vault. So I can get my uh, local IP address and reuse it. I'm also generating a random password, 20 characters long with special characters, for my virtual machine. Same for my uh, SQL Server environment. And I've got uh, um, some code here to create my subnets. In my variables file, there's the main side of the subnet. And this part will create um, the sub ranges, which I can use for my gateway, my bastion, my databases, and my VMs. I've separated my VMs from my databases because some people uh, need to be able to access the virtual machine, but won't have access to the database in the other way around. And this way, I can separate that traffic. So let's look at some policies, because I told everyone, create your policies. This is a policy definition. So I've got a policy for my virtual machine SKU. What are people allowed to deploy within my environment? I've got it in a category, user custom policies. I've got a policy rule. And here it's got a parameter list of allowed SKUs. That's it. There's nothing more in this. Because the second step is to assign a policy. And in my policy assignments, I've got my parameters with all the types of VMs I'm allowing for this specific deployment. 
So I've got a number of DVMs and a number of BVMs and even three F1s. These are not big VMs, not expensive ones, but the ones we regularly use. We've got a key vault as well. I'm hoping. Uh, security key vault. Right here, I'm creating my key vaults. So I'm using my the location for my resource group security. I won't have to code it again. It's just coming from variables. I've got my tags. My naming is all coming from variables. I've got a standard SKU name. It's enabled for disk encryption. So my VM can store its encryption key within the key vault. It's enabled for deployment. And I want RBAC authorization. Azure services have a default action of deny. This means that every Azure service in the world does not get access to my key vault. If I'm putting it on allow, in theory, every Azure resource in the world could access my key vault. And I do not want that. I would have control of the, um, of the resources that can access my key vault. I've got one IP rule. Remember the part in the main file? My IP in the response body is my IP address slash 32, which means just one IP address. This makes sure I can connect to my key vault. Second one, I'm allowing my virtual network subnet, my VM subnet, and my database subnet to connect to my key vault. They can access my key vault. You can also include a dependency. So maybe I want to create a key vault only after my VM is created or only after my database is created, which would be weird because when I've created my VM, I've also got my password and want to save my password in an earlier stage. Because I want to save my secrets, I've got my secrets file here. This is my virtual machine password secret. It's been generated in the main file. As you can see here, random password vmpw.result. As soon as it's been generated, it gets stored in my Azure Key Vault with this name, VM admin password, because it's the, admin, the password of the administrator. It will be saved in my Key Vault. I won't be able to see what happens there. The only way I can see the password is when I log into my key vault, open up the secret, and show its contents. Now, I won't go through all of these files because it will take way too long. I just want to show the last one, which is the uh, inbound rules. So I'm allowing port 443 for the gateway manager. This is one of my NSG rules. And it's got a description. Allow the Azure Gateway Manager inbound. It's a simple description, but it helps. It will help you so so much uh, when you're trying to analyze what or what all the rules were, uh, uh, are for. Second one, I've got a rule to allow Azure Bastion inbound traffic because it's using weird ports on ADA and 5701. These are not standard ports, so you need to add a description what it's for. In the beginning, I also told you that I'm using PowerShell as kind of a support act. So I'm using this deploy.ps1 file. This one has a number of parameters. I'm telling it, do I need to log in or not? Because the first time I'm going to run the code, I need to log into my Azure environment, not just with this piece of code, but also with this one. I need both to make sure I can do everything I need to do. I need to supply a tenant and a subscription because I think most of us are in this situation. We're in uh, working with multiple clients, with multiple uh, tenants, multiple authentications, stuff like that. Before you know it, you're running against the wrong tenant, deploying stuff in an environment where it shouldn't be. Explicitly define your tenant and your uh, subscription to make sure it's landing in the right environment. Then there are these two flags. Plan and apply. These are the default flags you can use with uh, Terraform if you want to just plan the deployment. Uh, 
which gives you an overview. This is what I'm going to do. Are you? And then it stops. So you can review your deployment, see if the changes, the updates, the deletes, uh, whatever happens, if you're okay with that, but nothing will change. When you're using the plan part, uh, I'm sorry, the apply part, it will also do a plan for you, showing you what's going to change. And then it will ask you, do you want to run this code or not? This is quite a simple one, just uh, uh, to help you along your way and use PowerShell. For uh, one of our deployments uh, for my company, we've got a huge deployment file with a lot of variables, a lot of things. It's even writing out all the variables, Terraform variable files as well. So when I'm running this deploy, what happens, wrong focus, is this, and it should auto play. I'm running my deploy to PS1 against a tenant and a subscription. These are the flags I'm putting in. I'm using the plan operator as false. My apply is true, so I'm going to deploy some stuff. And then I hit enter. In the first few seconds, not much will happen because Terraform needs to think about some stuff, find out where, where it is, uh, what the resources are that are already deployed compared to the local state um, that it has of the deployment. And now it's going to ask me yes or no. But let's first find out what's in here. Because I will be creating an Azure virtual machine. It will be created because it's got the green plus signs. It's going to create a virtual network. It's going to create uh, some identities. It's going to create subnets and more subnets and more subnets. And if I will keep scrolling during the recording, I'm going to create a key vault and a security group. And here you can see my uh, my text that will be used on every resource. And now I'm scrolling down again because I think, well, this looks good. So I need to type in yes. Everything else will uh, evaluate to no and the deployment will not start. And when I'm hitting yes, Again, you'll see the code thinking a little bit, connecting to the Azure Resource Manager, telling it, do this. I don't know what it's doing. I have no idea. It's, uh, and I, all I know is it's running. And all of a sudden, you can see this, creating, 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 creating. And this will run for 10, 20, 30 minutes, depending on all the stuff that's being deployed. One thing to be aware of, at some point, you need to uh, include uh, a sleep operator for the simple reason that the APIs are sometimes a bit slow to respond. You might see that a resource has been deployed. The API doesn't, isn't always aware of that, which means that the second part that uses that deployment might just fail just because it can't connect to the resource because the API isn't ready yet. I've included a number of five minute sleeps within my deployment uh, for my company to make sure it uh, the the uh, chance of erroring out is less. So this code has run. And now I can see what was deployed. I've got a number of resource groups, exactly as I defined them. I've got my tags, like I defined them, on all my resources. My resource group connectivity contains my uh, network interface cards, uh, my network security groups, my virtual network, like I designed. I've got my connectivity in a separate resource group. My network interface card, it's got a private IP address, nicely, like I wanted it. And my network security group has a, for my default virtual network, is associated with uh, three subnets. So this one can control all the traffic within, between these subnets. By default, it will allow everything. So now I can add rules to make sure only certain ports are allowed con a connection between these uh, subnets. In my data resource group, I've got my database. Uh, I've got my VM to work with my database. Should be maybe in a different resource group, perhaps. It's all about how you design your resource groups. And I've got my networking with my uh, 
the network for my SQL Server, where there's a virtual network rule that my virtual network can connect to my SQL database. I've got a managed identity, a user managed identity. I like user managed identities for the simple reason that these are not uh, dependent on the resource they're connected to. So I can uh, grant permissions to my managed identity. And if I want a resource to use those permissions, all I need to do is connect an identity to that resource. If I'm using a system assigned managed identity, I can uh, get the same result. But as soon as I delete the resource, that identity is gone as well. So when you redeploy that resource, you need to redefine all those permissions again. In my security uh, uh, resource group, I've got my key vault, as expected, with my secrets. I've got my SQL administrator password. I've got my virtual machine administrator password. So after creating all this code, which takes some time, I deployed it. This took about 25 minutes, I think, and I'm done. I can clean out my entire subscription, run the code again, and everything is back like this without me having to click through everything and making uh, mistakes time after time after time. And with that, I have come to the conclusion of my session. And I'm, first of all, thank you for your attention. And I'm hoping there are some questions. Uh, I had one comment only, which, which is about the uh, allowing your own IP. Uh, to, one thing to think about is if you connect from a corporate network, the chances are pretty big that you will have an outgoing IP address that is shared by everyone else in that company. So, so don't leave it open forever, basically. So. Very, very good point. Yes. Very important point as well. Um, in my company, it's even worse. Um, we're using a kind of Z-scaler Z -scaler solution that um, changes its outgoing IP every 30 minutes. Oh, fantastic. Yep, and it's got different IPs uh, depending on the port you're using as well. So if I'm using port uh, 3389, for instance, I'm getting a different IP than when I'm using port 1433 or port 80 or 443. Oh, wow. That's fun. I mean, it's it's advanced networking, uh, and it probably makes life hard not only for you but also for hackers from within the who who manage to get into the network. So, yep. so I guess it's good to for something. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a lot of good reasons, but it makes life quite hard for uh, deploying things like this because the amount of errors you are getting because uh, um, your IP address is wrong is mind-blowing yeah and uh, we have some questions in the chat ah, and cool. i'm going to start with what i think is the most important one is it also idempotent running the code several times without removing any resources in between yes it is and um, if you uh, if i would run this code again uh, it would change its local uh, sorry it would check its local state against everything that's been deployed and if it mm. finds no changes, it'll just say, um, uh, uh, nothing to change here, uh, and then the code will just uh, stop. Yeah, and I, I think that's the beauty of, uh, of both, I mean, Terraform, Bicep, what, what have you, that you, it, it's a, you define your preferred state. Yeah. Your desire, it's a desired state configuration, yeah. basically. The funny thing is, um, when I tried Bicep, uh, I think it was two years ago that I tried it for the last time, uh, Bicep didn't have a, a, a local state. So when I ran the code again, it happily tried to redeploy everything that was already there. Mm -hmm. I'm not that sure if it's, if it's doing the same now because I didn't try it anymore because we've got our focus on uh, uh, Terraform. But... No, it should check. Uh, against the uh, Azure Resource Manager and and ask it basically for everything. Do you have yeah. this? Yes or no. And if you don't have it, then it will ask uh, Azure Resource Manager to, to create it. Yep. 
for them? Uh, I know there there are some things if you like create a, a random post fix for resource groups, uh, you have to handle that in the bicep code because otherwise you will get a new random resource group and mm -hmm. then that doesn't exist and, and stuff yep. like that. Um, next question here is how do you handle data? It's a short one. I'm not sure I, I get understand it. Um, when it comes to data within databases or um, storage accounts, uh, I don't handle it from code. Mm. Because it's data, it's not something that I want to handle from code. It's something that um, it's also dependent on the customers how they want to handle it. Yeah. At least yeah, if, if, that's the, if that's the question, maybe there's another uh, context for for it. but. Yeah, and and I guess if you, I mean if you create an Azure SQL database with 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 any infrastructure as as code, uh, you know, framework or pattern, if that database already exists and has data in it, well then nothing is going to happen because it does already exist. Yep. So, I mean, it, I think it is a bit scary to start with because it's like, do I really trust this component to not recreate my database? Uh, but but once you gain the trust in using, uh, I mean, if, if it's Terraform or Bicep, then it it's it makes life easy. But yep. I like that you have the plan the possibility in your uh, PowerShell script to to just plan and not run it. Yeah. Uh, to be able to see that you didn't make a mistake, you didn't change the name of yep. them. So. Yeah, it's always worth it to, to, to just plan. And uh, if you're scared about uh, your data, if it will be overwritten or destroyed or whatever, um, mm. create a test environment just for your code. I think it's called a, a canary, can, canary test. Canary test, I don't know. Mm. Um, you can just run your code and see what happens. Uh, run it three, four times, uh, add data to a database, uh, run the code again and see what happens. Build your mm. own trust in, uh, in this one. Yeah. And uh, I guess also don't lose your uh, local state file. That's nope. bad. <laughs> That's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. Uh, By the way, the local state file is just a JSON file. So if you open it, you can see what's in it. And um, I would advise strongly against editing it. But in theory, it's, it is possible. Mm. Uh, it's still with un unencrypted passwords, right? Within the TF state file, uh, I think no. secret was stored in clear text, or or they're not. No, they're not. They are encrypted. Uh, okay, because I think that used to be the case with the TF state file that if if you just open it, it's it's gonna be clear text. But that's good. Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, it's an obvious security breach possibility, I guess. Uh, speaking of passwords, we have a question. How do you warranty that the random password won't be overwritten each time? Because it, the, uh, the hashed password is um, saved within the state file. Okay. So it will just check uh, for, the, uh, for the hashed password, do something in it, uh, uh, with it inside the code to check it against the key folder, I guess, and then mm. find out, all right, it's the same password and it won't change it. Okay. Cool. At least that, that's my understanding of that part. But I'm not, not a deep expert on the entire Terraform platform, but that's my understanding. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, if you already have the, the resource, in this case being a key in the key vault, then it won't generate a random password because it already yeah. has the key. Yeah. So. Uh, Jens asks, uh, do you have an easy way to restore a dev copy from a production database? Would you use an Azure VM or Azure Backup Restore or an Azure function implemented in Terraform? Um, restoring an... Uh, that's a good one. Um, uh, uh, my question to Jens is, uh, where, uh, where does the backup live? Because that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that answer uh, will give the give my correct response, I think. Mm. 
Yeah, and I think maybe if I needed it's stored in Azure, says Jens. Uh, yeah, in the Azure uh, as an uh, uh, backup, uh, uh, as in a Azure SQL database backup, where you can just click backup, uh, restore in the Azure portal, or on a storage account. Uh, let's see <laughs> if we if Jens clarifies. <laughs> While the answer typing is answer, I can uh, elaborate a little bit because uh, why I'm asking asking this question. I've got a client where um, we download uh, a backpack file daily from uh, a file share, where we unzip it um, uh, uh, and restore it to an Azure SQL database. And the only way I could get that working was a combination of a logic app, a function app, and uh, uh, Azure automation with a runbook. Oh, okay. And it's completely breaking my mind. On the other hand, I did write a blog about it. So if you want to know more about that route, um, go to my uh, blog site and find out um, uh, what I did there. Yeah. It's not something uh, I'm really proud of, but it was the only solution. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it, it feels like you have to go a long way to do something that you on-premise would do much easier. Yeah. But it, it is also something completely different you're working with. It's uh, yeah. So uh, Jan says we can back up to Azure and restore from a storage account. Uh, I see it won't be easy. I will have a look on your website to get some inspiration. Yeah, yeah that's, that's probably a good starting point. Yeah. Another good starting point if you never use Terraform is to to download the Terraform scripts that uh, Raycy uses in this demo and uh, and play around with it yeah. and. Uh, just use your, you know, MSD and subscription or whatever you have, and and because I don't think any of the resources you create are that expensive nope. in the demo, so play with it. See, log into Azure Portal, look at what you got, and and see how you can change that from code. And, and yeah, exactly. That. That's what the what the code is meant to do. Just play around mm. with it, find out what what it does, and uh, use it as yeah. a starting point. And if you if you're on a corporate network on a corporate computer, uh, chances are pretty big that you already have a lot of security policies that that might even make it impossible. Even if you have your own MSD and subscription, you may not be able to use that from from there. So try it from a private computer in that case, just to get familiar with the technology. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Uh, there are no more questions, as I can see here. We okay. don't have uh, the only comments on the YouTube stream was about uh, my audio and your audios slightly overlapping at one point in time. So it was more about the audio quality. But uh, I'm going to watch the stream afterwards and, and just see what adjustments I need to do on the production side of things. Uh, okay. But uh, I'll stop the stream to YouTube, so goodbye, YouTube. See you next time. And